Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be with you this morning and throughout this week. Um, I have told several people, I said, well, uh, I, I think I know one person in this congregation, that'd be Corey, I, I met him a number of years ago, uh, but, but it's been, been a long time since we've uh, seen each other, been able to visit. And I said, I, I'm not real sure exactly how I got the meeting uh, uh, scheduled there, but I'm excited about it. I, uh, maybe it was uh, several years ago in Crawfordsville I was uh, holding a meeting. I, I don't know exactly which meeting it was in the area that, that maybe you heard online, but I'm just thankful uh, to have the invitation to be able to be here working with you. I always enjoy uh, driving into this part of the country and Yes, I'm on the far side, on the, on the state line of Kansas and Missouri. That's, uh, it, it, Blue Springs is a suburb of Kansas City. Uh, we're on the east side of Kansas City as you're coming out on I-70 towards St. Louis. As a matter of fact, I'm so far away from St. Louis, St. Louis is halfway here. <laughs> and on a seven-hour drive, that, that's how, how far I am from St. Louis. But uh, it, it, was, it was a good drive and, and uh, got a lot done, able to listen to a lot of things, make a lot of phone calls and uh, but, but rolled in a lot later than I expected. And I appreciate so much the hospitality of Kendrick and Amanda. Uh, they, they've uh, taken really good care of me already and putting me up there at their house. And looking forward to the week. It's going to go by very quickly. I, I know you, you look out at the rest of the week and you think, boy, there's going to be a lot of lessons and a lot of things going on. But uh, as is usually the case, it, it flies by the opportunities that we have to be able to study with people in the community, for you to be able to arrange Bible studies or to invite your friends or family members to come and uh, to attend this gospel meeting, uh, just like that, it's going to be over. So don't lose any of those opportunities. As a matter of fact, if you can bring someone uh, this afternoon at four o'clock, bring them with you. Uh, and every night this week, uh, you, you'll notice on the, on the schedule of sermons, we're going to be looking at a lot of different things as we go through this week, really just a, an effort to, to proclaim the whole counsel of God, everything from Christian living uh, to matters within the church, to the plan of salvation, uh, just things that are going to help us, even, even in regard to the family on Wednesday night. Uh, I hope that you will uh, invite your friends to come and hear the gospel this week. <clears throat> if there's anything, uh, any questions that you ever have about the lessons I want to be as approachable as possible. Don't hesitate to ask me or anything that you might take issue with. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to sit down and study with you and, and cover that with you. This is all about Christ. It's not about me. It's not about uh, a you in particular. It is about Christ. It's about his glorification. And it's about each one of us drawing nearer to him as a result of what we do this week. And I hope that I'm going to be able to help you in doing that wonderful group of young people I, I see sitting up close here, and I'm glad that you're out here for the class. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, if you will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to look at a text in the first few verses of that chapter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I know you're familiar with this text, uh, but I want to explore it maybe a little bit further than what uh, at least maybe a few of you have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul begins in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness." Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now what I want you to notice in this particular text, especially is what we read here in verse two. He says in verse two that all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I don't know if you've experienced this, but there are so many times when uh, I may be reading through a text or listening to uh, uh, the audio Bible in, in my car, and I'll hear a verse that I've heard countless times, but maybe it's the inflection of the voice or someone who reads it in the scripture reading on, on Sunday morning, but it's just the way that I hear it that I realize there's something there that I haven't tapped yet. And, and going through your studies or your daily Bible reading, I bet you've run across passages like that. You think, 
Hey, I've, I've read that a lot of times and there's more to that passage than what I'm getting. I need to come back to that because many times I'm preparing for another lesson or a Bible class and I think, I need to come back to that. I'll make a note of it, put it on my desk and I've got quite a pile of those. And, and so when you finally get to come back to it, then, then you want to dig into it and find out what's deeper here. And for me, this text stood out because in my mind, I'm thinking, why is that in 1 Corinthians 10? And I've heard sermons, I've heard this passage referenced many times, and I've referenced it many times in talking about baptism. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and you've heard it in the same way. I'm just asking, what does that have to do with 1 Corinthians? And, and as a matter of fact, this text, after going through it, finding the richness of it, this has become one of the lessons that I teach in the preacher training program to help uh, new preachers and students understand how to take a text in its context. This is a classic example of understanding a text in its context. And so I want to start there with you, if you will, this morning and just consider the text in its context. When we look at this particular text, one of the first things that I want you to notice is the remote context. The context of chapter 10 is actually 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10. You know, as he goes through this letter to the Corinthians, he deals with different topics. Like in chapter 6, he's going to address uh, taking uh, brethren to court. And in chapter 7, he's going to deal with a lot of marriage questions or, or some questions they had asked him about marriage, and he deals with those very thoroughly. When we get to chapter 11, he's going to talk about a number of things, the Lord's Supper being included. And then remember chapters 12, 13, and 14 all have to do with spiritual gifts. Well, that's what we're looking at in chapters 8, 9, and 10. And chapters 8, 9, and 10 all deal with one thing, and that is matters concerning things offered to idols. Now, in Romans chapter 14, he seems to be addressing probably more the issue of the Jews, the Jewish Christians' conscience about eating certain meats and observing certain days. But in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, he seems to be dealing more with the Gentiles' conscience coming out of idolatry, and it pertained to eating certain meats that were a part of an animal that had been sacrificed to that particular idol and whether or not it was okay to eat that particular meat. So it, it concerns things offered to idols and specifically eating meats offered to idols. And what he's telling them is that eating this meat offered to an idol is, sometime, is lawful, but sometimes it's not expedient. I want you to notice with me, go back to chapter 8. And look with me there in verse 4. He says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. Drop down to verse 8. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. He's saying this is a matter of absolute indifference to God. It has nothing to do with your relationship with God and that idol is nothing and we know that. Now, we're going to find out in chapter 10, however, there is a way that you could eat of that meat and be sinning, but we'll get to that in a minute. Just kind of park that over here in the side of your mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. So what Paul begins addressing in chapter eight is that this is a matter of liberty. The eating of meat sacrificed to idols is a matter of liberty. You can do it or not do it. It doesn't matter. Now, let me just say this, that if I was going to put a title on this context, chapter 8, 9, and 10, you know how the translators are, uh, 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 will have little headings over certain paragraphs? Well, if I was going to put a heading over chapter 8, 9, and 10, I would entitle it, don't let your liberty become your Lord. Because that is what it appears to me Paul is addressing in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Because while a thing might be a liberty for some people, their liberties, what is all right to do, but you don't have to do it, they fall down and worship that liberty. They are unwilling to ever give it up. In a sense, it almost becomes their God. 
But he's addressing, first of all, that this is a liberty. And so Paul makes this appeal to the Corinthians to be willing to forego any liberty that might cause a brother to stumble or to hinder their salvation. Look in verse one. He says, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Then look in verse seven. He says, however, there is not in everyone that knowledge. He says, we know that, there's, that this idol is nothing, but there is not in everyone that knowledge. For instance, a new convert, a new Gentile convert, who still sees the idol as something. He says, for some with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. He says that when they eat of that meat, they cannot help seeing the connection to the idol and in their conscience, they are in fellowship with that idol when they eat of that meat because in idolatry, that's what they believe. They believed not only that when they ate the meat in the idol's temple were they in fellowship with the idol, but the meat uh, from that animal that was not offered to the idol, but that meat from the same animal that was sold in the marketplace, that was of prime value. They would take that home and eat it, and that was an extension of that fellowship for them. So then notice in verse 9, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. And let's and, and stop right there for just a minute. When we're reading this word weak in chapter 8, I want us to understand that he is not talking about people who are weak in their resolute determination to serve God. He's not saying these are people who would easily fall into immorality or it wouldn't take much and they'd start drinking again or, or they'd fall into fornication. That's not the weakness he's talking about. Look at verse 7. He says that they're weak. He's talking about their conscience being weak. And, and when we think of a weak conscience, we might think of someone who their conscience isn't very strong and, and so they give in to sin real easily. Their conscience doesn't find them back. That's not what a weak conscience is in this, con in this context. The weak conscience is the conscience that has not yet been trained to know that this is okay. It's on the other end of the spectrum. Instead of not knowing that this is wrong, is that they don't know that it's okay. You take, for instance, someone who's converted out of, of some world religion or man's religion where they've been taught that it's a sin to celebrate a birthday. And their conscience, in their conscience, they feel like that's wrong to do, but they've been taught now through the gospel that that's a matter of indifference to God. It's a liberty. They might intellectually know that it's okay, but in their conscience, they feel like they're doing something wrong. That conscience is weak because it hasn't been fully trained and, and, and uh, fully developed to the point to where they know that it's right, intellectually and emotionally. That's the weakness he's talking about. So in verse 9 when he says, Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. He's talking about those who still believe that it might be wrong to eat that meat offered to an idol. Verse 10. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? In other words, here's a guy that his conscience says it's wrong, but he sees you doing it and he wants to. So he's going to go ahead and do it, even though in his conscience he's saying, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't seem right. Verse 11, and because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Remember in Romans 14, he says, whatever is not of faith is sin. We have to know that it's right. We have to be confident that it's right. A thing can be right in and of itself, but if we believe or our conscience says it's wrong, we're not to do it. That's why he says whatever's not a faith is sin. He's not talking about objective faith in that passage. He's talking about my personal subjective faith. I've got to be confident that it's right. Don't go against your conscience. And that's what he's talking about in verse 10. He says in verse 11, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, listen to verse 13, If food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Notice, this is Paul's overall point. There's nothing wrong with this meat. It's a liberty. But don't let that liberty be so important to you that you're going to eat it at any cost. 
In other words, if eating that meat that you can do but you don't have to do is going to actually cause someone to lose their soul because they're going to sin against their conscience, you need to be willing to give that up. Now, you might think, well, boy, that, that seems like a trivial thing. Why were people letting that happen? That's not trivial to me. You tell me that I can't eat meat? You just ruined my day. You've ruined more than my day. I mean, I'm a carnivore. I, I, I barbecue. I love meat. If somebody says you can't eat meat, I, I can understand. That would be like, what? You, there's nothing wrong with it, but you're telling me that I can't do it? There are some liberties Really, any and every liberty, Paul's saying you've got to be willing to give this up. And as a matter of fact, Paul explains that he himself was willing to forego the liberty or the right to demand their support when they were weak and without knowledge. Notice in chapter 9, that's the transition to chapter 9, is Paul saying, hey, look at some things that I did for you. When he came to Corinth, there was the danger that if Paul received support from them, that they might look sideways at the gospel and say, he's just doing this for the money. He said, I didn't want to risk that. Even though I had the right, and that's what he explains in chapter nine, those who preach the gospel should live in the gospel. It is right to be supported as a gospel preacher. That's God's will. But it's not a have to. It's a liberty. And Paul had the right to forego that, and he did. How many of you would be willing to forego your salary for several months, maybe a year? How many of you are willing to do that? That'd be a tough thing to give up too. Maybe even harder than giving up meat, wouldn't it? And Paul was willing to forego that and mend tents and support himself even though he had a right to demand their support. That was a liberty. He said, this is an example of this. And he's explaining to them in verse 18, what is my reward then that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. He's explaining to them that he did this out of love for their soul. And as a matter of fact, he's explaining that he was always willing to submit his liberties to those who were unknowing in a sacrificial effort to win their salvation. That's what he explains in verse 19. He says, for though I am free from all men, in other words, I'm not bound. I don't do this because I have to. He said, though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all. Why? That I might win the more. I don't want to do anything to hinder the gospel, he says. Verse 20, to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as those under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this is a text that a lot of people have done great violence to. When you hear people read this, I become all things to all men, sometimes they'll make an application of that that, you know, we just need to be more like people of the world so we can reach them. In other words, we need to be looser in our conduct. We don't need to be so stringent about the way that we dress. We don't need to be so strict about uh, maybe the entertainment that we partake in because we, when we seem so different from the world, we're not going to reach them. We need to become all things to all men. That is not at all what Paul was saying. The context of this is not being looser than what God allows. What's the context? It's being stricter than God requires. See, the Gentile believed that they couldn't eat meat to idols, and that was stricter than God required. He, he was fine with it. And what Paul's saying in chapter 9, remember, he didn't take a wife, and he could have. He was stricter than he had to be. He didn't receive support from them, and he could have. He was stricter than he had to be. So when he says to the Jews, I became as a Jew, what he means is, I didn't work on the Sabbath, even though it wasn't wrong, now, now that the gospel of Christ has been preached. And, and he would observe certain feast days, and he wouldn't eat certain meats. It was fine to eat pork, but he wouldn't eat it when he was preaching to the Jews. So when he says, to the weak, I became as weak, he doesn't mean weak morally. He's talking about the weak conscience person who was stricter on themselves than they had to be. Paul said, I did the same thing. 
I wouldn't eat that meat offered to an idol. He said, I became all things to all men in the sense of being stricter than I had to be in order to win them. Don't let someone take this passage and do violence to it by saying that Paul was saying that we can be looser than what God allows. That's not the context. And his whole point is that he's wanting to win them and in their salvation, verse 23, this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. That's a beautiful usage of that word koinonia. The word koinonia is translated fellowship or partaking. And our fellowship in the gospel, and clearly Paul wasn't talking about, you know, when we hear Paul or a preacher speak about fellowship in the gospel, sometimes we assume that he's talking about support, financial support. But he wasn't because he didn't receive financial support. How did Paul partake of the gospel with them? How did they share in the gospel? By their obedience to the gospel, see? That's the most important fellowship that we're going to have this week. So it, it, we all need to partake or share in obedience to the gospel, and that's why he was doing it. And so this was his motivation. He did not let any liberty come before anything. Drop down to chapter 10. Go to chapter 10 and look in verse 32. He says, Give no offense either to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Now, this is the remote context, okay? We've looked from chapter 8 to chapter 9 to the end of chapter 10, and what we did is we circled around chapter 10 and verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the remote context is things uh, concerning things offered to idols. Let's look at the immediate context. In the immediate context, he's dealing with those who are not willing to forego some liberties. And he says, those people are not going to be victors and they are not going to finish that race. Chapter 9 and verse 24. Verse 24 through 27 of chapter 9 leads into this text that we started with, okay? So what's Paul talking about in verse, verses 24 through 27 of chapter 9? He said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Paul is saying, you know what? This principle of being willing to forego liberties, this isn't a foreign thing to you. I, I know that you understand this. Take, for instance, the athletic games that these Gentiles were very familiar with. He said those people that are a part of athletic games in our culture, we might think of someone who is training for the Olympics. He says, you know what they do? They forego a lot of liberties. A young gymnast or a swimmer, who wants to be on the Olympic team, they're not going to eat at McDonald's with their friends. They're not going to go hang out on the weekends and sleep in late. There's nothing wrong with sleeping in. I mean, it's not good all the time. <laughs> there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with eating at McDonald's, uh, you know, cheeseburgers and drinking soft drinks and things like that. But if you want to be on the Olympic team, I can just about guarantee you, you're going to have to forego some of those things. And that's his point. They're temperate in all things. And why do they do it? He said they do. They forego all of these liberties, things that are not inherently wrong, but things that they are willing to give up in order to win a crown that is going to perish. It's not even going to last. It's going to fade away. He said we do it for an imperishable crown. He's making this a corollary uh, a comparison here. Now, verse 26, therefore... Okay, based on that principle, I run thus. Here, here's how I run. This, Paul says, this is the way I roll, okay? He said, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air. He said, I'm not playing church here. I'm, I'm not just doing this for show. I'm trying to get to heaven. He says in verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. And I'm not just telling you this. This is real. He said, I'm an apostle. 
And I still have to discipline my body constantly. And disciplining his body in the context is not just saying no to sinful things. He says, I have to be willing to forego some liberties. We're going to be talking about that in the 1030 worship service and at 4 o'clock in part 2 of our study. Being willing to forego some liberties. That's his whole point. Lest I should become disqualified. His whole point is, even though a thing might be a liberty, not a have to, you can actually lose your soul over it. If your attitude toward that liberty is wrong. And so then, his point is that a proud overconfidence in knowing that it's okay to do could actually cause their spiritual demise. Go back to chapter 8. In chapter 8, he tells us here, what time does class end? Is there going to be a bell? 10.15? Or 10.15? Okay, good. Good. In chapter 8 and verse 1, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. They were overconfident in their knowledge, but let me make this point. I've I've studied with with a lot of brethren that are uh, uh, maybe participating in things that are without authority. And when you, you address that and you say, well, where's the authority for that? And you point out, here's what the scripture says. I've had countless people say, okay, Brett, you you know, you've got all these scriptures, all these verses, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. We just need to love each other. That is not what this verse is saying. Paul is addressing a situation here where there were brethren that were unwilling to give up liberties, even if those liberties were going to cause another brother to lose his soul. Their attitude was, I don't care. That's his problem. He needs to get it together. He needs to get this figured out. I have a right to this, and I'm going to keep this right. We, we, we've got to be really careful about that attitude. And, and look, I'm a, a proud, patriotic American. I'm all about liberty. I, I'm all about the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, all of that. But let me tell you, There's not any right or freedom that I have in this country that's more important than the cause of Christ or someone being saved. And I don't care what's going on in our culture. I don't care what's going on politically. There is no right, there is no freedom that's more important than freedom from sin. And we've got to make sure that we're willing to even forego some of those liberties in order to maintain unity and to maintain salvation in Christ. And I'm not making any particular application right now. I'm just saying that this is the whole point of this. When we're looking at liberties, we might know something is right, but if our attitude toward our brother is not right, then all that knowledge has done for us is puff us up. This scripture is not saying that knowledge is not important. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Without knowledge of the gospel, we can't be saved. And Paul is not dissing knowledge in any way. But what he's saying is that knowledge in order to save has to be coupled with love. Knowing the gospel without loving God with all of our heart, mind, and soul is not going to save us. And knowing what's right without loving our brethren is not going to save us. We've got to put that love before all, uh, 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 we've got to couple that love with that knowledge. So this overconfidence in knowledge, just knowing what's right is not enough. And he said that could actually lead to their spiritual demise. Look at verse two, if uh, uh, in uh, chapter eight, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. He's about to reveal to them there's something they don't know and they're actually sinning. So let's notice then, as he gets to this point, their overconfidence in their knowledge was actually leading them into fellowship with idolatry. Look in chapter 10. In chapter 10 and in verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. He says, you, you know these things. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing, which we bless. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. He said, you know, when we eat of this, 
in, in our assembly, we are in fellowship with Christ. He said, verse 18, observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? Verse 19, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to an idol is anything? Well, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. An idol is nothing. He says, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? They were going into the idol's temple and eating that meat. Now they've crossed the line. You know, there are certain secular holidays that we might observe as a family with no religious connotation to it whatsoever. And, that, and we have the liberty to do that. Somebody might forego that liberty and say, well, I don't think that's wise. I'm good with that. But we have the liberty to do it if our conscience allows us to do that. But you take that same secular holiday and a Christian goes into a denomination and celebrates it as a holy day, that's a completely different thing. And these Christians who could eat the meat sacrificed to idols that was sold in the marketplace, they could eat that in their home and it was fine. They were now, because of their knowledge, thinking, well, there's nothing wrong with this meat because there's nothing wrong with an idol. They went into the idol's temple and ate it. And Paul said, you see, you think you know so much. You haven't stopped and considered. You're actually putting yourself in fellowship with the demons that are behind this idol. Even though the idol is nothing, who's behind idolatry? Satan is. And you're making yourself a part of their worship. You're making yourself a part of what they're doing. So Paul is making clear to them that what they were doing is they were too confident. And, and going back to verse uh, uh, chapter 9 and verse 27, even Paul himself recognized that as an apostle with all his knowledge, remember verse 27 of chapter 9, even when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Even he could be lost. And he had greater knowledge than any of them. And so that brings us to our text. And the text in chapter 10 in the first six verses is giving us an example, an Old Testament example that they would understand of some who were once saved, but who didn't finish the race. And it appears that he is addressing primarily the Jewish Christian who knew that that idol was nothing and that that meat sacrificed to an idol was nothing, but they also knew the Old Testament. And they knew about the Israelites that Moses led out of Egypt. And he tells them about this example. He says, you know, these people, he says, they were, uh-oh, oh, I picked up the wrong one. <laughs> That's confusing. He said, they were baptized in effect, they were baptized and delivered, just like we are. They were baptized. He said, yeah, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were entombed in water. They went down into that sea, water all around them, the, the water of the cloud over them. They were baptized into Moses in the sense that they, they followed him into that sea as God's Savior, as God's deliverer. And he also explains that they were partakers of spiritual food. Verse 3 and verse 4 all ate of the same spiritual food, just like we do in the Lord's Supper. Yet their bodies were scattered along the racetrack without reaching the end. Look at verse 5. With most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Why? Verse 6. They lusted. They craved evil things, not necessarily sinful in and of themselves, but they were so focused on what they wanted, on personal liberties, that they were murmuring about it. They were so focused on what they wanted over and over again, God was destroying them, and it's because they weren't focused on the promised land. They weren't focused on God's reward. They were focused on what they had or didn't have right now. And so Paul says in verse 12, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He's talking to these people who have knowledge, 
He said, you, you who think you stand, you who think you know everything, you better take heed lest you fall. Don't let your knowledge blind you to what you might be doing that's wrong. Going back to chapter nine, discipline yourself. Forego any liberty that might cause you or your brother to stumble. Essentially, don't let your liberty become your Lord. And as we're going to draw out in the next hour and this afternoon, don't let your liberty cause you to lust after evil things or to become idolaters. In other words, to fall down and to worship those particular things. And so he says, I don't want you to be ignorant in verse one. I don't want you to be unaware. You need to know what happened back here in the Old Testament. Is there going to be another bell or is that it? Okay, good, good. So that's why he gets us to this point about being baptized into Moses. His whole point is that here is an example of people who were saved and then were lost. This, to me, is one of the greatest examples of the fact that a person who is saved can be lost. That's, if that's not his point, I don't know what it is. It, it's, it's, it's lost on me. His whole point of chapter 8, 9, his whole point of the first part of chapter 10 is, here are all these people that were delivered metaphorically like we are, baptized, delivered, saved, eating of the spiritual food, and yet, how many of them entered the promised land? when it was all said and done. I count Joshua and Caleb out of all the adults that came out of Egypt. With most of them, God was not well pleased. Boy, that's maybe an understatement. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit understated anything, but wow. So the lesson for us is this very thing. But here's some points that can be made from that. One of the things that we see, because he's showing us an example of people who were saved but were lost. How were they saved? They were saved through water. You know, God used water many times to save people. You think about Naaman, the Syrian, 2 Kings chapter 5. He was saved from leprosy by dipping in the Jordan River, uh, the, the blind man in 1 John 9 and in verse 7. And in 1 Peter chapter 3 in verses 20 through 21, he speaks about a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. There's also an antitype which now saves us. Verse 21, baptism. Oh, it's not a new thing that water would save, but they were saved through water. Their baptism was in water. It was not a baptism in the Holy Ghost. It was a baptism in water, and it corresponds to ours. Their baptism was a burial, just like ours. They weren't sprinkled with water. They were entombed in water. They went down into the belly of the Red Sea with a wall of water all the way around them. Their, their baptism was by faith. Remember how Moses said to them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? In Hebrews 11 and 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. It was an act of faith to go down into that. And their faith was in the working of God. Just like ours is. Colossians 2 and in verse 12 tells us that baptism, our baptism is through faith in the working of God. Our confidence is not in ourselves or in the water. Our confidence is in God. And that's where their confidence was. Yes, their baptism was unto salvation. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and in verse 15, he says, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. When we think about their salvation, here's what's interesting. It says in Hebrews 11 and verse 29, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. When we look at the account in Exodus 14, what happened to those Egyptians? They washed up on the seashore. Their captors were washed away. Our sins that hold us captive are washed away in baptism Washed away in baptism. Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling 
on the name of the Lord. And the last point is that their baptism was not a guarantee of perseverance because they were all baptized into Moses. And yet with most of them, God was not well pleased. My friend, baptism is necessary for salvation, but it's not the end of salvation. If it's the end, it's the beginning end. We live the rest of our life walking by faith and not by sight. And this is what Paul is, is telling these people, just because you were baptized, just because you eat of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, and just because you have greater knowledge than many of these Gentile Christians, don't think that just because you stand, you'll never fall. This is the text in its context. And that's how, that's how we study a text in its context. The remote context, the immediate context, and the text. And now this passage, wow, chapters 8, 9, and 10 are brilliant. But the first part of chapter 10 of being baptized in Moses, that's rich. Now I get it. Hopefully you got something out of that. Maybe you'll be able to make some application of it. I appreciate your good attention.